So first of all, I'm going to thank you all sincerely on behalf of the whole OpenMR um, board here, um, because we really loved your talks. Yeah? And I mean, every talk had their own uh, personal vibe, which we really like, because there is not one format to science communication. We don't believe that um, in that sense that um, everybody should do what uh, uh, he or she feel, feels confident with. Um, and also, um, yeah, using their talents indeed. And you see that in every talk we've had here, everybody uses their talents. So we started actually the day uh, with how are we going to include the society in our research? And we had very nice ideas by Seco de Connect uh, who, who started off today. Um, and then we had actually a lot of people building upon these ideas and actually really adding every time, uh, adding concepts uh, that, that are really recognizable actually. Um, so um, we should not think, I, I, I list some bullet points here that I really wanted to mention also to recap a little bit to start the panel discussion. Uh, I never moderated one before, <laughs> so um, I, uh, <laughs> let's see how this goes. So one thing, uh, some things that I really wanted to mention also is that indeed we should perhaps not think too narrowly in our own discipline. We see also that all these different initiatives really combine different disciplines. Uh, so so uh, not only stick to mathematics if you're a mathematician, um, but also look at biology, look at uh, whatever, look at uh, uh, law, I don't know, um, to really see how other people uh, operate as well. Um, so get out of your comfort zone. That's one thing that I picked up from today as well. There are many different options for science communication and everyone is actually achieving the same goal, I would say. Yeah. So um, perhaps there are uh, some um, topics that are already shared with uh, the panelists, but uh, uh, actually quite uh, recently this morning, I uh, got the first, uh, well, I got a, a mail from Guillaume that uh, had added the topic. Um, so Guillaume was um, actually saying, well, perhaps it's a nice starting point because I think it's, um, it, it could be already a nice point to start with. Um, so he mentioned the challenge and opportunity of engaging in informal science communication in the context of public funded research projects where activities are often defined and budgeted before a SICOM opportunity arises. If I'm correct, Guillaume, um, this essentially means that sometimes in, in, in science and in research, we're bound with uh, some kind of with, with uh, deliverables that we have to do. And sometimes uh, science communication doesn't fit within that strategy or you don't have enough resources, enough time. Um, and how will we deal with this? Guillaume, perhaps you can be the first one to, uh, to, um, uh, what do you say, to comment on this. Sure, my pleasure. Uh, so it's basically what I was trying to say in my presentation before is that um, th there is an opportunity because a lot of research is done on public funding, um, meaning that there are grants and there are contracts and so on. And uh, from my experience, which might be different from your experience, uh, when I'm in this project, it's, it's difficult to get out of the way. Uh, because of the way these projects are designed. Um, and, and, but at the same time, there is a lot of opportunities because more and more um, in research projects, we have to justify and to demonstrate that we actually reach out to the public. So um, yeah, that, that's a challenge, but there is also an opportunity. So they have, they ha there should be a way to open some doors and to create some more connection with the civil society that is organizing a lot of science communication activities outside of institutions. So that, that was my, uh, my main point. For the panelists, feel free to unmute and uh, comment on this as well. Huh? I, can, I, I think, I, I, for instance, for ERCs, I know that they have, a, they dedicate parts of their uh, applications to, and, and I was thinking actually today, um, I think part of that money on communication was being spent for people to go for conferences. I'm not sure though. And now that uh, you know, conferences are getting, I, I wonder what happened in 2020 to that um, money, if it was really put into science communication uh, uh, or not. But uh, over that, not just for specific projects, for instance, I started in the science communication office with, with a given budget uh, given by the, Institute itself for this science communication um, uh, office. I mean, I started in the science communication office. So I think also institutions should start looking at their 
structure, administrative structure to have science communication offices which have their own budgets that can, uh, you know, then work with freelancers or they can uh, uh, start them um, also um, uh, collaborations, let's say, with, with other entities. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for uh, for for that uh, addition. Indeed, I think it's uh, something that has to be um, implemented in, in in the general mind. So the, so the general uh, workflow within the university, there should be a place for science communication in, in general. Perhaps um, I can uh, touch upon a different topic over here. <clears throat> do we have enough options for young researchers, for example, and do we have enough support to get people started in the first place? Maybe I can... Uh, oh, yeah, go. Oh, go ahead. Go no, ahead. no, 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 go and then uh, I cannot see what you say. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my experience, um, I believe those opportunities are really there, but um, they are sometimes uh, like they remain undiscovered. Um, I myself had the luck that um, a senior colleague of, of my lab was also a, a large, uh, a big fan of, of doing science communication things. And through him, I learned um, about um, uh, science communication summer school of three days, I believe. Uh, every year it's held in a different Flemish university. Um, the name escapes me. I think it's called Let's Talk About Science or something. And uh, I joined that several years in a row, and that was really amazing. Like several workshops, um, as many attendees. There's there was like no limit on the number of attendees, I think. Um, so yeah, there I took probably my first steps in in becoming more confident about um, doing these kinds of things. And also, I think uh, at my university at the time, K11, I think they organized plenty of. Um, so-called skill workshops, um, where you, which you can follow voluntarily if you want. Um, so yeah, to, to summarize, I, I believe those opportunities are there, but uh, you need some kind of catalyst to, to uh, bring your, them into focus for you sometimes. Yeah, de definitely, if I can uh, jump in, uh, they are there. And sometimes the most difficult is that you know, when you do research, especially when you're a young researcher, like a PhD student, you don't necessarily have the time or the resource or you don't know necessarily where to go. Um, and I think that's that's the problem. So we need to like kind of have some places or reference places where you know where to go and uh, where to see science communication. But I think we are in a very evolving era where, uh, to be honest, like 10 years ago, science communication wasn't part of the package. When you were doing science, you, you, you could do, you know, some, some stuff, but you had to be very senior, you had to be an expert. Um, it would be something like journals, radio, maybe podcasts. And we have more and more um, opportunities now that are very nice, that are like can go from Twitter to podcast to YouTube to any kind of things. Um, the thing is just it's not structured well yet, because I think it's going up a, a bit everywhere, um, like universities, they realize they need to um, to organize that. Also, funders now, they are asking most of the time for science communication in fundings. Um, and actually, I talked to the INR in France, in France, sorry, I'm mixing French and, and English. Uh, I, I talked to the INR in France, which is uh, like the big um, science funder. And they realized that they are asking scientists to do science communication, but they don't support them. So they are on the way to find ways to support them. But I think it's taking time, but it's, it's changing. And I bet in five years, it's going to be completely different. And already you can see that there are lots of workshops and trainings for PhD students for science communication. The problem is that for it's good for it's getting there for PhD students, but it for young scientists, you know, young researchers and even senior researchers that are not in PhD right now, they don't necessarily have trainings and they are implemented for PhD students, but not necessarily for researchers. So that's a second step. But it's definitely it's it's amazing how changed uh, how how big the change has been in the last five years. So I'm quite sure it's coming. It's just that it's needs, it needs to be structured and it's coming for so many different um, you know, stakeholders and players in the field that it's gonna take a bit of time, but it, it's getting there. 
If I may add on this, um, I also noticed that uh, indeed the options are there, but they are not always well known because it's also uh, they are popping up a bit everywhere. So it's also hard for university uh, departments to to keep track of that. But what I've noticed is once someone is inside one initiative, um, let's say that they get acquainted with uh, with others and they, they get more creative on what they would like to do. And, and we have some volunteers who quit uh, research to do science communication. Um, I don't know if it's a good story to tell, but it, it happens because they found new uh, motivation. But one thing that is also quite effective, I, I notice, at least in Belgium, is collaborating uh, between a collaboration between initiatives so that we can share the communities. And we, we've done quite a few uh, joint events with other um, science cafe initiatives. And so the people from um, the Bright Club in Belgium, for example, they, they, they got to know Pint of Science and, and Pint of Science communities got to know Bright Club. And so hopefully the communities are, are growing and exchanging and moving around. So people now, they're aware that there are people uh, doing comedy club uh, with the University of, of Brussels. Uh, they're aware that there are science cafes. So it's also good to collaborate so that people get to know the other ones yeah. and it doesn't cost a thing. Very good point, Guillaume. I'm going to uh, uh, pass the word to Seiko, I guess, to, uh, to comment on that. And yeah, I, I want to add on to what Elodie was saying about the package for the PhD. This is something uh, I think a lot of us recognize, and I at least recognize it from when I was doing my PhD, is that um, science communication or public engagement outreach doesn't, isn't generally seen as part of your job as a PhD candidate. Uh, it, a, a PhD supervisor will say, your focus should be on research. Maybe you should do a little bit of education, but uh, who are you uh, to start on some science communication project and why are you spending your time on this? And I think it comes down to this basic system of recognition and rewards that we're trying to change uh, in Europe and in the Netherlands as well, uh, where we're basically having to reevaluate what the basic premises of a PhD are really. And um, in some cases, this has come boiled down to four or five articles to be published in four years and put in a booklet and that's it. But I personally think the portfolio of a PhD should be much broader than that. And not only for the reason that I want everybody to be sheep with five legs, but more importantly, because only 10% of PhDs will actually go into academia uh, after the four or five or maybe even eight years that they've been a PhD. So this, um, what I'd like to, uh, I'll put it in the chat, but there's a, a very nice PhD driven initiative at Utrecht University uh, by Young Science in Transition. And they're saying the PhD competences uh, are broader than just research. You should be able to develop yourself in different fields such as science communication as well and public engagement. So why not you as a PhD go with your supervisor or the person who got the grant to the grant commission uh, or to uh, a, a group of patients that uh, you are actually doing research for or um, go to the Beard House where they have a discussion on the interference of 5G uh, in your brain and there's a lot of concerned citizens around. Why should you as a PhD candidate not be the person eligible to go there? Uh, this is really something that goes, I think, to the core of recognition and rewards. And uh, I personally think we should start there. Very good point. Thank you very much, uh, Siko. Um, perhaps, Moss, I, I think you first had a, had a question and then we move on to Sarah. Then, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Sure. Um, I completely agree uh, what the previous uh, speaker said. Uh, and also, I would just like to add that uh, I think nowadays in many uh, research grant, uh, there is a very key component or an extension about uh, public engagement or outreach programs or even diversity programs. Uh, so this is really uh, where the, the fund or the resource uh, comes from to do science communication and uh, knowledge exchange. And actually, I think uh, many of our, our PYs are um, struggling with how to fulfill the requirement of uh, doing science communication. And I think this is really an, the opportunity or the, the place that our PhD students or postdocs can make a huge contribution to the, um, to the, to the funding requirement. And also in terms of the deliverables, uh, it's, it's really very, very uh, broad. 
I mean, uh, it doesn't have to be a very structured paper or a talk, uh, but at the same time, it could be a blog or a podcast, for example, or even just uh, participating in, in this kind of, uh, you know, virtual open MRI conferences. So I really think that, you know, if, if you are very keen or interested in doing some uh, science communication and looking for resources, uh, please just feel free to, to speak with your PI or your uh, department head about your uh, aspiration and uh, they will love your ideas and then they will definitely put you in contact with their uh, grant manager to, to work out a plan for you. Thank you, Moss. Um, Sarah, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, of course, a lot has been said already. I thought maybe it's interesting uh, to just add on to that. Um, I think we've talked about support and reward. Um, and I was happy to see that Ilodi was talking about the evolving times that we're in. I think, indeed, if you look now, even five or 10 years before, it was completely different. So, yeah, I think there's support. Um, but you know, you have to know where to look. And uh, I think Guillaume has said that before, once researchers have found us, okay, they're there and they will participate in, in a lot of different things. They will uh, put up collaborations themselves and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's something that we have to work on that the support is not too hard to find. Um, so that's for sure. And then on the other hand, you know, getting a reward for doing science outreach, I think we there's still a lot more room there. Um, we've talked about this, but it's becoming a part of funding applications. Um, I know that's the case for the FWO, that's the Flanders Research Foundation, that's one of the bigger foundations here in Belgium. Um, and this is actually the very first year that we're getting requests from researchers and scientists if it's still possible to participate in an outreach project before a funding deadline. And for me, that's crazy. That's a huge shift. Uh, it makes me really happy, of course. Um, and it also means that for the first time, also these young researchers have an incentive to do these projects, and that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, on the other hand, I wanted to maybe give a little side note. Um, I also think that research should always be able to exist without having to communicate about it. Um, not every researcher is good at it, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know? Um, it doesn't mean we don't have to encourage them. It's my job, I'll be the first to do so. Um, there also always should be a place for people who are just talented in science. Um, and we have to maintain a balance, I think, between seeing some science outreach as a good and very valuable asset that we should be able to, to get rewards and etc. in our institutions and in the system. Um, but it shouldn't be something that is necessary uh, to, do, to do science outreach. And maybe there's a solution in not putting the responsibility on, on one person, but maybe looking at, at groups and making sure if you are higher up in the academic chain that you have a team where you have these different talents available. Oh, and maybe good to, good to add, um, I think we were talking about, about credits at the VUB. It's good news for us uh, again. Um, people who are doing a PhD, they have to complete this program for 60 credits. And I know that you can get credits for participating in our science outreach projects. So um, yeah, luckily we're, we're in good papers there. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Indeed, I, I also recognize, uh, well, this you said, I, I just uh, added uh, an additional topic uh, to my list according to what you said. But first, let's listen to Simon. Yeah, thanks. I, I just wanted to uh, wholeheartedly agree with what uh, Sarah has said. So I think that uh, incentivizing is a bit the, the crux in this whole discussion. Uh, so now we have to rely on the goodwill of universities like, like VUB or the goodwill of your PI to give you the freedom and time to, um, to engage in, in, in such a project. Um, yeah, I, I think in general, we, we as researchers are very used now to the idea of an impact factor, which is like a citation metric. Um, I think now we are all used to it, but if you would explain to your 10 year younger self when you were in high school, for example, 
that uh, this was going to be your core objective during your PhD or during grant applications to aim for high citation counts or in, in high uh, cited journals, I think you would get a very strange look from your younger self, right? So I hope that there could be some slow change or, well, ideally a rapid change in mentality about what it means to have impact, right? I mean, in a, in a utopic world, I think impact would consist of not only citations, of course, but it would also consist of having impact of people outside of your fields, um, just members of the, of the public who are interested in science uh, and who your message has an impact on. Uh, like, uh, like Siko mentioned, I believe, like there's so much um, bullshit science, meta science going around that your impact is going to be considerably uh, more positive on society as a whole if you can um, help people to be more critical towards uh, such um, yeah, fake news, let's say. Your impact can be so much larger than the, the narrow interpretation we in academia give to it, I think. But yeah, it's quite utopic, I think. So it will require a mentality change, I believe, from systems uh, bigger than even uh, a whole university, probably. But let's stay optimistic about it. Thank you, Simon. Um, let's continue with uh, with Jill. Perhaps uh, you have something to add. Yes, I was just uh, wanting to mention the the personal impact actually for uh, for the, the the people that enroll in a in a parallel uh, activity for in, during their PhDs. Like I have my case where I started actually developing my my design skills by helping a group of uh, students and postdocs at uh, the Champalimau in Lisbon that we created some, like a TED talk kind of a series of events and while I was volunteering my time to help with the communication visual communication of, of these events I was also gaining skills that then uh, helped me out to to you know in, in this case for my parallel uh, uh, job and and um, uh, for my current job and like me a lot of other people that I know because they were doing science communication they were is getting a toolbox of of uh, things that they could use as as cycle i think was saying uh, the bottleneck for academia is is immense i don't know like is it 30 percent for postdoc and then 10 percent for uh, for pis you you will eventually people will eventually need uh, a bunch of skills so that then when when faced uh, with uh, with uh, with decisions they they can play around and see what what do I have so the impact okay the impact to society is important the impact to your institution because you're creating when you're creating a, a science communication event that a lot of people come to it, it brings prestige for your institution that that's an impact but also for yourself and, uh, and and for your career even if it's not in academia who knows but at least you you gain a, um, a palette of things that you can play with Definitely. Thank you so much, uh, Jill, for commenting on that. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, because I, uh, there was also something that I picked up here, isn't it also a problem that, for example, if we're, um, so that, that really relates to the effect sizes, I guess, that I heard from Sikko's uh, talk as well. Um, so if you're, um, if you, if, if you're just uh, addressing everything as a dichotomous thing, like it's significant or it's not significant, and it's very difficult for people to actually grasp what's what's going on, what to believe, because indeed, perhaps it's significant, but it's ridiculously small. And it's just a yeah, it's, it could well, it, it's it's not really an effect to 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 solely rely on. And that's why I just also wanted to ask the question: What do you think about uh, science communication, in a sense, being indirectly affected by the way uh, science? is just how, how, how the publication system is arranged. Yeah, maybe I can comment. The, I think the issue here is that, yes, scientists amongst themselves have trained each other to only publish stuff that is significant and as a result that is the thing they expect or is at least somehow uh, uh, surprising to all. And a lot of focus goes there and there's sort of a filter between uh, between this and what gets communicated to the public. And uh, this is this is no... Uh, this is no accident or something. It is part of the, for example, the business model of the big flagship journals of Elsevier and Nature to do this. This is the way they make money because they have stature, etc. But it creates this 
situation, uh, I think I, I mentioned it in my talk this morning as well, that, that the only thing that gets talked about is results. And actually, I found, find the results, uh, they're not meaningless, of course, but I'd ne I, I'd, I very rarely find the results of uh, a piece of research the most interesting part. I find the methods and the approach and the definitions that are behind it much more interesting. And, and a lot of this also training on how to do science communication is, is focused to uh, make your research more palatable to what, for example, a journalist or a TV talk show wants to hear. But th this is where we have to push back as scientists. Like, no, this is not the only relevant thing here. And maybe just to give one short example, uh, we've, we've seen this from with Corona, uh, this, this difference between the PCR test and the, the quick test. And uh, there's, there's, there's journalists writing about it like, yeah, so the, so the quick test is much less reliable than the PCR test because they don't overlap. And nobody takes the time and bothers to explain what the basic difference between these two PCR and antigen tests is and why they give different results. And this, I think, is, is a symptom of this exact thing you are describing. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that there is a lot of overlap just in that uh, way of way of thinking and uh, way that indeed and that, that that again connects to what we value most uh, and then what is uh, what is valued in the scientific community. So it's really nice to to think about it like that. Um, just also perhaps uh, twisting the conversation a little bit towards um, is the first co-author, sorry, is the first author of a paper responsible for the science communication? And that actually starts the communication, that starts the idea of collaborating because um, that is perhaps something that is, yeah, I, I don't know uh, how that works uh, for you, but with um, uh, in, in our research, for example, I often take the lead as my, uh, being the first author, like, okay, I will uh, take the lead to get this to the public. Um, but should that be only me, or is that actually the whole author list over there? So I hope somebody can comment on that. Mm. Um, I don't know if anybody has any, uh, any thoughts. And just say about, uh, again, the experience of working in a science communication office in, at an institution, normally what happens is that the, the PI actually says, oh, hey guys, we're gonna publish this. Uh, so if you could make a press release uh, about it. And, uh, but I'm not sure if that, that is outreach though, but that's the experience from science communication office. So the PI. Yeah, and so why not approach this in uh, like a team approach? Some people like speaking with the media, some people like to speak with other stakeholders, some think that it's important to uh, address research when you're teaching your students, that, that especially when you're with more people on one research project, why not divide these tasks? It's, it, it's a good training for everybody. You can also teach each other and uh, build up some experience. I think that the PI starts the process, but then, uh, yeah, then whoever gets the interviews might be preferably the first author or the PhD student, for instance, yeah. yeah but I noticed this when I was a journalist that whenever you approached like a group, then most of the times, yes, the PI would respond. And I always thought like, like, you're probably not the person who did this research in the first place. Like you were doing this hands-on. And if you have an actual interview and a discussion, you learn such a lot about how, what actually went into the process and the people who actually did it are much more likely to, to give you a, a proper view of it. That's a, that's actually a point where I'm uh, where I try to get at, and so that that it, it sh in in my opinion it should be a, a team uh, effort. Uh, okay, uh, if you're looking at the paper, okay, you look at the author list, but even beyond that, I mean, if you're in a lab and you have you have some people that are also passionate about uh, the science communication, that also relates, I guess, to what Sarah said. Like, not everybody is good at at uh, communicating science, so why don't don't we create some kind of community within that? And, and is a lab some kind of responsible? for having some kind of community that, that, that does that for them so that they are assured that, uh, their, that their research is getting communicated. Maybe I can uh, give a small addition, um, not from my own experience, but from um, a good 
close friend of mine. She is doing a PhD at the Flemish Institute of Biotechnology. And I think they have a really nice system, uh, like they, they rotate. Um, so every week, a different person is the social media manager for all the different channels that they have. So a really nice approach, I think. So the, every week it's somebody else taking responsibility to, <clears throat> to bring all the research of the whole of their whole lab um, out into the open on uh, via different platforms. So I think that's really nice. Um, I think it's it's um, how do you say it's not completely voluntary. They're a bit expected to engage with it. So I mean, it's expected of uh, the lab members to uh, to help with this and to take active part so that uh, they respect the rotation system, etc. But I, I think um, most people there are really happy about it. And I also like the system quite a lot. I think. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't know if there are any other additions to, uh, to this topic uh, in particular. Um, I just came up with the idea of also talking about um, how science communication and what we've learned today can also uh, help us to, um, so we're, we're still probably remaining for some time in the, uh, in the unusual Corona circumstances. And how can these, uh, these things that we learn here, how can they improve the, 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 yeah, the last stage, hopefully? Um, and how can that also extend to the post-corona era? <laughs> Let's call it that way. Um, perhaps there are any thoughts on, on that here? Um, so putting it that into that perspective. Well, maybe. Yeah, well, to, yeah. mm -hmm. th there's one thing we've learned over the past year. I'm not sure whether everybody really followed the uh, publications on COVID. But especially in the beginning, there were these websites where you got these conglomerated uh, uh, papers by everybody from all around the world, and they were all suddenly open access. And uh, it was really interesting to, to take a look at this. And there was a, a, a columnist from the NRC who wrote about this, I think, uh, a month ago uh, in one of her columns. And she said, yeah, that really showed us how much crap people produce. There's a lot of publications out there that really don't add anything uh, to uh, the general body of knowledge. And uh, that could, of course, you could be saddened by this, but in, in another sense, you could say, well, at least now we know, and it's out in the open, you can sort of tell people like, really, was this really necessary to put this out? And uh, it should have sort of make us rethink, I think, because through this, this, this process that was sort of initiated by Corona, it's like maybe we should reevaluate the amount of stuff we put out because it might be a little bit too much. Yeah, exactly. I think it, uh, it it learned us a lot um, already. Also, to well, to um, to communicate virtually is 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 certainly not the thing that is very easy to do. I also had to uh, to present uh, earlier this year on a conference, um, and that was all uh, recorded. And I had to one half an hour, and I could, if I if I made a mistake, I could just uh, take five seconds to to put it all right. So it's also very stressful. But besides that, is of course you don't have any engagement with your uh, with your audience um so that's indeed yeah uh, I, I see that guillaume wants to comment on it as well yes i, I saw in the chat that someone is asking the uh, the um what will be the takeaways from the corona period for large uh, festival like pint of science mm -hmm. uh honestly um uh, we, we're not thrilled by the idea of continuing online festivals but uh, we know for a fact that there will be occasional events online um, because it's uh, we've gained capacity. So uh, in Belgium, for example, we have the team in Brussels. They took the um, to the festival, and now it's become something that will stay. So they will maintain this series of online events by themselves, um, and we are happy to 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 maintain that. But for the festival itself, we really want to go back to the pub. Uh, not because we miss drinking, but because this is where the magic happens. We yeah. just don't have the same magic online. And we don't pretend to have the magic formula for great uh, Zoom meetings. I mean... Uh, yeah, I think it really depends on, um, you know, uh, on what your festival or what your event is about. Um, and I think probably some are translating well to online and it's actually okay because maybe they can reach 
more. That's the thing about online, you can reach further than uh, you know, if you were in a room. Um, but for Pint of Science, it's, it's definitely not the best way because our, as I said um, at the talk before, our DNA is really meeting someone uh, being able to talk to that person, having an experience, you know, really uh, being there in a room uh, with a cozy feeling discussing with someone. And online, even if the chat is amazing, the people are um, discussing in the chat, the speakers are great, it's not the same, really. Um, but you have some uh, online events that are actually translating quite well. You also have some, um, you know, people that started doing uh, Twitch streaming about science and it's actually really good and it's not instead the problem with point of science is that we did online instead of real and i think it's not gonna stay because we want real thing. Uh, some people developed some extra stuff like twitch on on top of what they were doing and that's that's really good and probably that kind of thing might say more um and they, they might stream still because you know for example you have uh, in france you have big um science journals um you know like for the general public that started doing some streaming and it worked really well and i think it's something they might add to what they do anyway um no it's not going to replace so that's the question is it replacing what i did is it replacing well is it is it actually making it better or is it just something I added, and I think probably the added things are going to stay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely also something because we we uh, you you also indeed uh, highlighted the downsides, I guess, of uh, of the virtual uh, thing. On the other hand, of course, we can uh, we were now able to have a hackathon project from somebody from America, um, and that's in, in that sense, it's also nice to have uh, had, well to have had that uh, person here because it was virtual. So perhaps there's also some kind of. Uh, of a way we can still use it in the in the future and still learn from it, but of course it won't ever replace the the physical uh, physical meetings as well. But that's that's like what Guillaume said, for example, that the festival is going to stay the same, but Couch of Science might stay, and that was like another thing. So that's exactly that. Like it's it's forced us, like 2020 forced us to be really creative which was crazy stressful, but also we learned a lot. So we might develop some new things in like your hackathon or some, some other initiatives that are actually reaching, reaching better or reaching different people. Um, so it, 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 it was a good lesson. It, it's just, it was a bit hard, you know, <laughs> but it was a good lesson. <laughs> It's a good lesson, but it lasts a long time. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we probably we didn't need that lesson, but you know, it was it was good. Um, it's just uh, I think probably everyone panicked when it started, and we were all stressed trying to change things. And I think if we knew it would last that long, we would probably have taken a bit more time. And be like, okay, th th there is no rush. Just like think it through. Uh, Last year, what we did for Point of Sense is that we moved it from two months, which was pretty stupid. For example, we should have just like straight thinking this is going to last what do we do but you know lessons very good thank you Ellen. so um most did you want to comment on that as well yeah um so i think uh i mean in our institution uh, in the past uh whenever we had any kind of in-person meetings uh some of them were actually being live uh, streamed on, on Zoom, but uh, I don't think there were a lot of people attending the meeting on Zoom, uh, most likely because uh, like the other speaker mentioned, uh, the discussion is more interactive in person and the exchange was more effective if we, had, if we can meet face to face. And also there was this you know, benefit of um, having a drink or some free snacks uh, in, in the event. Um, but also I think that um, we recently actually did a survey in our institution about the uh, continuity or the um, uh, what happens post uh, pandemic. Should we uh, continue to, um, to do the same, to, uh, to offer Zoom uh, meetings or should we switch back to the more traditional uh, meeting format? And to our surprise, actually, a lot of our members believe that uh, we should run most of the meetings in parallel because having this Zoom or the uh, virtual uh, platform really removed the geographical barrier 
of uh, attending a, an international meeting or any kinds of uh, discussion to uh, with, with with your colleagues. And also, it's it's quite uh, beneficial who, for people who work remotely or who, um, for example, wanted to spend more time with with their family or their loved ones. And, and also, I think uh, in in a lot of the the scientific conferences. Uh, the organizing committee are already planning for um, having the the, the future uh, conferences to be both uh, in person and online at the same time. Maybe uh, for different uh, different reg registration fees, uh, mostly because of the geographical barrier and also to to broader broader the uh, the benefits of uh, of the conference. To for example. Uh, institutions who have a limited budget or um, ge geographical uh, concerns. So I really think that um, this um, this trend of uh, meeting online that we um, had to learn in the past year will more or less uh, continue in the in the near future. So that's why I believe that you know keeping your Zoom ethic is extremely beneficial for your future career development or even job interview and so on. Great, thank you so much for your comment, um, also indeed that perhaps there's, uh, there's some kind of, uh, yeah, uh, intermingling of, uh, of the things yeah. in the future. So thank you very much um, for, for commenting on this. The last few minutes of the panel discussion, I would like to also give the opportunity for people to um, still um, discuss something that they um, would also like to have mentioned here. So uh, either from our participants or from the panel members. Otherwise, I have one myself here. Uh, but, uh, I think there were some questions in the chat, but they are way back. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I couldn't keep track of because uh, <laughs> at a certain point there were like uh, five plus ones and then I lost track of the questions. <laughs> it's no problem. I, I looked at it, but I still I am still lost. So. <laughs> Is there somebody that has posted something in the chat that we missed? Because then yeah, I think Remy and uh, and uh, Stefan both uh, asked asked the question, but I'm I'm not sure what they were. <laughs> uh, it's okay. We can skip. Uh... We can skip it. We can prioritize other people if they want. Okay. So please shoot indeed if you have another uh, another mention. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, to give one. Okay. Then perhaps um, it might be nice to um, give some kind of a use, well, some kind of scenario. What if your supervisor really uh, is not 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 even not really willing to cooperate, but actually really uh, blocking you from doing science communication. How do you handle that situation? And do you have any experience? For example, do you already have uh, some kind of, well, handled such situations and how did you do that? Stop tweet them on Twitter. <laughs> uh, I, I actually, I had that, uh, I had that during my postdoc. Uh, my boss told me that I should hide find of science in my resume because uh, it wasn't looking professional enough. Yeah, but that was, it's funny, it's ironic because that was uh, at the beginning, so it was 2014, and then three years later, I asked me to organize a pint of sense for the department. Irony. Um, so I would say probably it's gonna, it, it's gonna come to them anyway, because so many grants are asking for science communication that at one point, they are gonna be like my boss, they're gonna hate it, and then two years later, they are not gonna have a choice. Um, so. If you don't have that time, it's okay. But I would say if if you're not allowed to do it and you really want to do it, you can try to do it on your free time because it, it those are skills that you're going to learn for yourself as well. Um, you don't have necessarily, you know, to to do it during the, the lab time. And and to be to be honest, things are going to change. So I'm there are some PIs that are not okay right now, but they are they are going to have grants. We are going to have they are going to have to explain what they are going to do for science communication. And trust me, they are going to be super happy. Uh, you're willing to do any. Yeah. Also, from my personal experience, it wasn't so necessarily the fact that my supervisor didn't want me to do science communication or outreach, but a lot of my direct colleagues were saying like. Who are you to go to a general audience and tell them about neuroscience? It's like, well, 
my friends, I'm teaching master's students, so this couldn't be much worse, could it? I probably have the level to explain this to, to an audience of people interested in, for example, how the action potential is generated. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think you should really, as a, as a young and early researcher, think about what your career path will look like uh, going on to the future, which might be in academia, but quite, <laughs> quite uh, possibly will not be uh, in academia or not in a research sense. And you are allowed your own personal development. Uh, and this is part of, of, of any CIO or <laughs> a discussion that you have with your employer. So th this is just part of the game. So maybe I, I get the, uh, the suggestion of doing stuff in your free time, but maybe you could also just say, fuck it and just do it. Of this rebelism. <laughs> it's, uh, very... It depends on your boss, you know, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what are you, they're going to do? Fire you because you did yeah. something? Yeah. Well, I hope there are not many people that encounter that. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to give uh, the word to Guillaume and uh, Moss. Um, first, Moss, perhaps, because I saw the, the hand first there. Afterwards, I uh, am afraid that we have to close up because uh, we also have to uh, round up. I think uh, quarter two was actually uh, the planned end time, but we can, uh, we can have a little bit of, uh, of delay, I guess. Go ahead, Moss. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree with uh, what uh, other panelists uh, have said. I mean, since we are all in, in the academic community in, in general, so we should really just value the, the principles of uh, the freedom of opinion, the freedom of research and the freedom of speech. So there is no barrier or no, uh, cons there shouldn't be any concerns to, to express your opinion and to express your views on, on, on the topic that you, uh, you have worked for so many years. And I, I can tell you that uh, the, the general audience or the general public will love it. And uh, most of the time we are using uh, taxpayers' money to, um, to, con to conduct our research. So this is really a, a um, kind of a closing the loop uh, process of, uh, um, uh, of telling our, our public, you know, how, how they invested their money. And also another benefit of science communication is that um, no one will criticize you really. I mean, there's, there's no reviewer tool in, in, uh, in science communication. True, thank you, Moss. <laughs> um, so perhaps Guillaume, then uh, you get to, to close the get the closing word <laughs> for this. Oh, wow, so much pressure. I'll try to be quick then. Um, I'm not a researcher, never been a researcher. So just my feeling would be if, if someone was to tell me you can't communicate about this or that, or you don't, can't take part in this activity, maybe ask someone else to go and ask for, on your behalf, for example, um, ask um, the producer of a podcast to go and ask your supervisor if someone could talk about the research. Because maybe there is some skepticism behind, maybe there are some concerns that you can completely overcome by having someone from the outside say, yes, what you're doing has value. And, and we would very much like to uh, interview your student or yourself. Or, or maybe another trick is to ask a supervisor to be directly involved in himself and see that uh, is actually super fun to do. So just be sneaky. Fun and rewarding. That's uh, something that we should uh, definitely take away from this panel discussion. Um, okay, with that, I would like to close the panel. Um, I would like, love to thank you all for uh, being involved, both with having a talk, uh, being actively involved in this discussion. Um, I guess we've seen a very, well, very much point of views on science communication, but I, uh, the, the thing that I take away is that there is a lot of consensus of how we need to move forward and that uh, we're definitely going to get there.